you ask them like, oh, what's, what's the attitude we're supposed to take about assimilation? Do we say that, look, you know, uh, we have to do our efforts, but at the end of the day, 80% are going to intermarry. Yes, yeah. Ramos Shapiro is tell what, how am I supposed to look at it? So he looked at me and he said, you know, can't say that we're going to lose, you know, majority of the Jewish people. He reaches out his hand, like, like he reaches out his hand and he's looking at me with his hand stretched out with a hand, just like we know that iconic, scary, evil looking kind of hand stretching out and he's just looking at me with his hand stretched out and I'm thinking there ain't no way I'm saying that I'm just not I can't like come on you gotta explain this to me because I don't know what's going on over here and he's not saying anything and after this very very long pause he looks at me and he goes Basia and I'm like oh yeah that's exactly what I thought you were saying like no and then he's like why did she stretch out her hand and I'm thinking I don't know I don't care just as long as it's not the other outstretch hand that's fine you know whatever so he goes why did she stretch out her hand and I'm like I don't know she wanted to reach he said but she couldn't reach it was ridiculous she obviously couldn't reach so why did she stretch out her hand he said because when you see a baby crying you have to stretch out her hand the human thing to do is to stretch out your hand he says this is what you have to tell them he said tell them they're all coming back they're all coming back but I said they're all coming back he said they're all coming back I said okay great <laughs> as long as you say so I'm gonna go tell them they're all coming back so by the way guys they're all coming back hello everybody you'll be hearing a lot about this topic in this episode of the meaningful people podcast I sat down with Robert David Markowitz he spoke a lot about assimilation intermarriage rate and what we can do to make sure that all the Jewish children do come back because they are coming back. Um, Rabbi David Markowitz is the executive vice president at, at Olami. Olami is one of the biggest conglomerate Kirov organizations in the world. So many uh, organizations are under Olami and we speak to him about that topic. So listen big in this episode of the Meaningful People podcast. So excited to bring this to you. Of course, thank you to Isaac Newman for sponsoring this episode of Zechon Hashmas' mother, Recham Paramakalea Bas Ari Leib. And of course, a big shout out to our friends at Alpert and Associates. Okay, you know what? Maybe you went to a doctor recently and the doctor said a lot of things that you have no idea what he said, but he said, you know what? Just go to AMR Pharmacy, go pick up that medication and you'll be good. And you're like, okay, he's my doctor. I'll listen. But when you go to Alpert and Associates, they make sure that you know what they're talking about. They're not going to talk about the weather and the predictions and the Dow and the oils and this and that. They make sure you have a financial plan that you understand. They bring it down to your level using the most advanced technologies and programs to make sure you have the best plan, but making sure that you understand the plan fully. And that's what you have when you work with Alpert and Associates. So give them a call at 718-644-1594 or send them an email at alpertmosha at gmail.com. And now enjoy this episode of the Meaningful People Podcast. You are listening to the Meaningful People Podcast. The podcast featuring our nation's most impactful, influential, and meaningful people. Those are really cool. I, I have never met anybody who grew up in East Brunswick. Anybody here grew up in East Brunswick? <laughs> so, you, so you said before, we don't know if it recorded, but you said you grew up in East Brunswick, like on a farm. My dream is to grow up on a farm. Yeah. I mean, when serious. you start that way, it kind of takes like the other extreme. Everybody, you know, you kind of imagine like, oh, I grew up on a farm. Well, it was, it's kind of like a city and then. And then you're like surprised that there's a chicken and you're like, oh, it's a farm. Yeah. Uh, that's city people, Brooklyn people. And I was yeah. born in Brooklyn. So you think like, oh, there's one chicken. Now it's a farm, you know? Open parentheses. Um, I love how you still have a dream to grow up on a farm as if like. I don't live on one right to, now. No, as if you get to grow <laughs> up again. I, I I usually view myself as if I'm like 14. Always growing up. Love growing it. up. Yeah. Kid forever, you know? Good. I, I do feel like I'm still, still a kid. kid. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. Froze at, I think I froze at 19. Uh, this, erroneous. Man. Yeah. Why? Because you're a grown man, dude. I don't know. I don't. I don't view myself. Feels. Enough. It feels that way. It feels. We feel a young feel. It's yeah. good. It's good. Youth. Yeah. How are the youth? Like yeah. <laughs> My kids are older than I feel. You know, it's like a weird thing. That's true. You know, but uh, but that's what it was growing up in East Brunswick. How, long, how many years were you in East Brunswick? Uh, from like seven till I got married at 19. Whoa. Um, so you didn't so, grow up in Brooklyn. Uh, yeah. Brooklyn no, no, just no. like, let's play Jewish geography. I grew up in Brooklyn. No, no, no I didn't like grow up in Brooklyn. I just, That's I got married at 19. Good for you. Yeah. 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 Highly recommended if you happen to already know that, 
that is the right shit up for you. Right. This is like yeah. pre Nussie project and everything. Yes. Yes. Yeah. We grew up, you know, in like a, it was a modern Orthodox community in East Brunswick. So we knew each other and then uh, got involved in NCSY. It was like, you know, getting more into Judaism and more passionate about things. Like, all right, that's it. I can't talk anymore. And my Rebbe from Lakewood, he's like, no, 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 this is, this is a good idea. You should stick with it. He was very smart. She was a year older. She is a year older than me. Went off to Israel, disappeared, and then, you know, I was with a girlfriend, but she wasn't around, so that worked. That's so interesting. So you did it right. You did it the right way with guidance. With uh, it's not easy to find the right person. So when you find the right person and you can, you know, build a home together, it's it's the greatest gift in the world. Very interesting. Okay, so I guess um, when people are younger, they sort of have maybe some ideas of like, when I grow up, I want to be this. I want to be that. Um, when you were younger, did you grow up and be like, I want to be in Kirov. I want to, I want to work in Kirov and this is, I want to devote my life to, I guess, Avodah Sakodash and, and trying to bring people closer to God. Was that on, on the path you were seeing yourself on? So in a way it was like a dream, but a dream that I kind of knew was not possible. Why not, why not um, possible? I grew up in NCSY. So, you know, in NCSY at that time, there were a few full-time positions, I, it was like you know, volunteers, basically people who worked, you know, as NCSY advisors and those is very part time. So I looked around and I'm like, yeah, I loved, I was very involved in NCSY. I loved that. That was a lot of fun, very meaningful, but I figured that there wasn't really a career. Like there wasn't something you couldn't go and do that as like a profession. Um, so I thought, you know, I'll be a Rebbe or going to be, I, that was, that was kind of the direction I figured I was going to go. Um, it, it just there were no positions to really be had at the time, and so interesting. It wasn't a thing then, not at all. No, no, it wasn't. And those people were very well entrenched in their position. So it was like you know there were like twelve positions in the whole country, and you know you don't want to hope anybody. Anyway, whatever. Yeah, it wasn't. We weren't hoping for those. It was you know wish them well, and I was like okay, so I got to go do something else. But right. but the dream, like oh that would be unbelievable, you know, Shabbatones and trips. Uh, that sounded like. But it was it was non existent as a, as a field, you know. I'm curious, actually, if I could pull it back yeah. a layer before yeah. before you start talking about the career trajectory. You shared that you, as a child, had an experience with NCSY and ultimately evolved to a from lifestyle. I'm wondering, from your perspective, I know you're at the top of an organization that is so involved in effectuating this change in people. I'm wondering from your perspective how you experienced it. Yeah, I, I grew up, NCSY was was fantastic for me. It was, it was a great uh, community. I grew a lot through it. Um, I come from a, a from home. You know, my parents both grew up. My father grew up in Barrow Park, my mother in, in Far Rockaway. Um, what's, yeah, my, what's your mother's main name? Davis. Uh, okay. Yeah, not the one who wrote the Matsuda Sitter or whatever. There's always, everybody always asks me about that. But my grandfather was a, was a Rebbe here in, in Hila and became Hank oh, cool. for like 50 years, you know. Um, so my, my parents were, you know, very committed. We had a very, very Jewish home, you know, always learning, always, you know, uh, committed in that way. And in a modern Orthodox community, people went either way, you know, that was, it wasn't so simple where, where friends were going and, and my friends growing up weren't particularly on the religious, you know, spectrum of things. Um, so NCSY was, it was a fantastic community, uh, grew a lot there, really connected, spent two summers in Israel and NCSY Kolel and got, got very committed there. Um, so, so it had a big impact, but also they also had an outlet for, um, getting involved with people who had no background. Uh, and so while I was in high school, I was teaching, I was writing programs. I was kind of like, uh, exposed to that side of it. And I was like, this is, this is awesome. You know, something really special about when, once you touch it, it's like, there's no going back. Yeah. You know? Right. So I guess in a way, you, maybe you saw yourself going into business, but I think very much of Curve nowadays, you have to have a business mind when approaching something like that, no? I think you have to have a passion for Judaism. Um, and then the people who are running, you know, out Curve organizations usually tend to be entrepreneurial. They're looking to build something. They're, looking, they're creative in that way. So it has a similar characteristic to people who are in business. But um, I think the core of it is really a person who's passion cares deeply about Judaism and wants to share that and gets lit up when, when somebody else gets lit up, you know, that that's the core of it. Yeah. I totally hear that. Um, spoiler alert. Mm. Olami. Yeah. For people who aren't familiar. Yeah. What is Olami? Well, most people would be not familiar. It's kind of like the cat's getting out of the bag, but we, 
we're really trying or we really tried hard to keep it a secret for a really long time. Um, you know, Olami is, is effectively the umbrella organization for all cure of outreach um, goes on around the world outside of Chabad. Um, so any organization that you might be familiar with, you know, Jam, Jet, Maor, Rage, Emmet, Aish, uh, JRC, all the J's, you know, whatever you're <laughs> going to find anywhere around the world, um, they all are part of the, the Olami global network. Yeah. Uh, that started from a funding perspective, you know, Olami, which wasn't named Olami at the time, was giving money to support, to really start a lot of those organizations um, and and support them and, and help them to grow. And then it, it evolved over a bunch of years. Uh, and then there was a moment when the, the, the donors, the management team kind of realized like, hey, we need to do more. Uh, and that was really when they created Olami. And they said, all right, let's let's do that. But but you don't really want to let that cat out of the bag. When you go public, you want it to go big. You know, you want everybody to know it and to be amazing and not have any preconceived notions and let them kind of define what it means. So we've tried to keep it quiet for a while, but no, you know, it's, like, it's getting out there. Yeah. I know some of the the people behind the, the, the donations and the support and the incredibly magnanimous just support that's being provided at yeah. that umbrella level for all of those organizations they they do things very quietly and like there's a reason that their name is not like everywhere i i i'm sensitive to that yeah at the same time i'm wondering if you are able to share any kind of sort of insight into the passion that's driving all of that yeah i mean you know all of me really started with two families um it's it's not a secret but they're very quiet about it um they're quiet about it because it's not about them they, they never made it about them. It's, they, they were never interested in their name being on anything. They're very um, you know, humble people that are committed to the cause above all and never that it should be about them or their names. Um, that's the Wolfson family here in, in, in this area. Um, started with really Zev Wolfson, all of a sudden. I mean, what he did, really yeah. unbelievable. Um, for, for what's now Ola Mi and for so much of the Jewish people that as time goes on, I hear more and more stories. I'm like, why do you behind that also? Like, you know, talk used- about someone who, who like, you know, nowadays it's like a very hot topic, people with wealth and, and what they do with their money and how they can effectuate change. It's like, Zev Wolfson has been, he's, he passed away several years ago at this point and the impact that he is still having today and his kids are having and his grandkids are having because of, of, of just, I guess, you know, there are similar people like them. You know, Albert Eichmann was the same the same way. It's just incredible what they're what you're able to do yeah. when you're blessed with with the money. And and like like you were saying before, it's it's not obvious that because they're blessed with money that they would do it, and certainly not hundred you know? percent. Yeah. Um. So he he really was was committed to figuring out how to have the biggest impact and and in the most humble way. Uh, which is just so remarkable. Yeah. Uh, with all of that, uh, and, and it should be mentioned, right? So the, the, his partner, uh, is Ellie Horn, who lives in Sao Paulo, um, partners only in, in their outreach efforts. Uh, they, uh, they met in a very cute story that they always fight about who brought who in. You know, uh-huh. Each one says, oh, I brought him in and you know, <laughs> got him out. Um, but they started in a, in a relatively, t- till today, compared a uh, modest way. You know, it was like a few projects here and there that they partnered on. Um, and then it grew and grew and grew and grew, and they, they just kept um, expanding the the impact, such that now you know you have three hundred branches, with a thousand educators all over the world. Wow! It's like it's huge, 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 and these two families really stood the whole thing up. Um, so you know that is amazing. Um, but with all of that and all the amazing things that they did, when I came into Olamide, which is just under eight years ago, I still had the I don't know audacity, I don't know, stupidity. And I just, I just thought, you know, like, like any other donors, you kind of hope they'll give the money and stay out of the way. You know, like, I hope they're not going to mess around too much with what we want to do. Um, and I, I couldn't have been more wrong. Like, they're there every day. 7 a.m. this morning, there. Donors. Yeah, he was there. You know what I mean? Right there with us, helping, figuring it out. Let's go. Let's build it. it it's unbelievable, the level. I mean, the commitment is it really it, it gets us, you know, going in the morning and staying up late at night because when you when you see people who who could really write a check and just that would be amazing in its own right, but it's so much more. It's all their heart and all their soul and everything. It's, it's just awesome. 
it's also it's it's a good uh lens for those who have the means to give many times like people think like give the check and stay quiet because you're nervous that they're going to overstep but it's like it's like for carrot like just step in the right way yeah don't don't step in with the oh i'm going to control i want to control this i want to control that be a sponge go in there see where you can add value you know and i'm sure given the way that many people make their wealth they have value to add to an organization that's you know trying to grow and reach people all over the world yeah maybe mo- you know, most of all mr horn often said like his job is to shake the trees you know he comes in he's like we got to do more we got to come on how are we going to do it what's going to happen let's figure it out let's go he's so bothered by it every time he talks about it he cries really I would, yeah he, he he didn't grow up religious you know and he always tells the story that he was he was on track he was dating somebody very seriously who was not jewish and it got to like a critical point where he was kind of about to get married and he realized like wasn't sure about it and he spoke to a rabbi and they, they told him you can't you can't do this and he came to terms with it and he said okay i you know i break it off but he said it broke his heart it broke his heart you know he loved her and and he didn't have enough of a connection to judaism to understand that and he he effectively committed his life to making sure that no jewish child should ever have to go through that no jewish child should ever have to go through not knowing why it's so important and he's committed to sharing that Jewish education with, with every Jewish person. It's amazing. It's like the pure heart, like each time you feel it, it's like with all love, it just cares. Yeah. I love how Nahi applied, like how you applied the expanding the lens. I love of, you too. <laughs> but just to, to double click on Nahi's point, finding something that you are so passionate about to support is so critical, especially in today's day where Kali Yisrael has become so skilled at developing different programs and different organizations and different ways to support our community. And Baruch Hashem, anyone that is blessed with Shefa has plenty of opportunities to help out different causes. But to find, and, and if it's important to, to support all causes, of course, but to find something that you are so uniquely and individually passionate about, whether it's based on your own story or just based on a cause that resonates with you for whatever reason, and to just go all in on it with mm. your resources, with your time, with your heart, so that when you're showing up at that meeting, that's moving you to tears. Like, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of another story. Mr. Warren tells a lot of stories, you know, so he said that early on when he decided to commit to this and he put in some initial money and it was, it was, I guess by our standards, it's a lot of money, but at that time it was still, you know, relatively a small amount of money. Um, and and right then, that first year, his business like tanked, and he was it was really like he just did not have the resources. And he said that he turned to Hashem, and he said, "Really, like you're you're checking me? You that's what this is? Okay, fine." And he doubled his commitment that year. Wow! And he said, "Even if I'm gonna have to go into debt." I'm doing it. And he said from there, his business went through the roof. It, it skyrocketed. Uh, so he, you know, when you have that passion and you apply it all the way, but all the way means like you're really committed. That like, this is really what you're going to do. Whatever your cause is. To the end, then, you know, then the bracha comes. So interesting. I, I don't want to like uh, downplay. Like a lot of times, like you open up a book and you'll read the story of the guy who gave money and he doubled it and, and then he was successful. But the period in time in which he probably found himself where his business was tanking and he maybe was going bankrupt, like that period was not just an hour. Like that was probably a period of time where like, I feel like that's what needs to be high. Like, like okay, Baruch Hashem, it worked out, you know, but that point, that, show, that shows a galas of Adam right there. That shows a galas of a person to be able to make a decision of like, he could very well make a phone call and say, don't have the means to, you know, I'm, I'm overextended, you know, I'm overextended, you know, like I can't do it. But the, 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 um, for lack of a better term, I don't like using the word leap of faith. You know, I don't know if Jews believe in leaps of faith, but to, to basically make that move and say like, no, like I, Hashem, I see what you're doing. That's, that's like greatness. That's greatness exemplified. Yeah. And you sharing that, that, that he was willing to go into debt to continue to double down on the cause that's indicative very evidently of tzedakah is not a box to check 
on a to-do list right. over the course of the day, but it's, there's a need here that needs to be served. There's a cause that we must perpetuate. And if I have to go into debt in order to do that, that's how passionate I am about this cause. Yeah, and, and while the donor side of it is amazing, I think when you look at the educator side, yeah, uh, when they're on campus on a given day, you know, you're going out there and you're meeting people and you're schmoozing with a kid and, you know, it's a long haul. You know, the people aren't like showing up saying, hey, you know, teach me Torah, Torah Rabbi. Rabbi. Like, yeah. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way, you know. It's like every day. It's Only like, Yeshiva guy in that Purim way. does that. Like, yeah. Rebbe, I want to be a base of Mikdash. You know, like <laughs> the Purim, the Purim drunk Yeshiva guy. Rebbe, guy be a Nasser Ogu? Like, no, I can't. I remember my first year I worked in uh, in UCLA. Starting, it was like almost 20 years ago. And uh, a few months in, I sent my over Berkowitz. It's so You're also right, Berkowitz Talmud? Oh, yeah. Big oh, my, we go run, but you can't hide. <laughs> uh, Oh my gosh. It's okay. not surprising. Let that. the drinking game begin. Every time I Berkowitz <laughs> is mentioned, hit it. Evolve, <laughs> Listen, he, he builds people. Yeah. You know, you go to, you go to a Berkowitz and you get the bug. Like, that's it. It's funny because not only does he, he build people, he builds people who build people. Yeah. You know, like, um, how many communities in the world are the way they are because of Ray Berkowitz? Because and, of his students. He won't leave Israel. Really, you know, he, he will never ever. I mean, he doesn't leave ever, and and he's like has every reason to leave. I mean, every reason from you know going to meet with people, speaking, the fundraising for every reason over the years. Really, I mean, he he grew up in Israel, grew up in New York, he grew up in New York. Okay, yeah, yeah. it's very interesting. His well, time is extremely valuable. Like, yeah, I think it's like a kedusha thing. Yeah, really. Yeah, he he doesn't talk about it, but like you know. Okay, that's yeah. that's interesting. Okay, good yeah. uh, good scoop. Appreciate yeah. that. You need to be grounded in the Eretz HaKadosh in order to have such long branches. Let me ask you, you had mentioned uh, in, in, the, in the outset that you didn't really th see that in Kirov there was like a full-time position. And now, the fast forward, you, ha you find yourself being the executive director of an organization that, like you said, has th over a thousand educators, full-time working, um, over a hundred million dollars a year spent on Kirov. That, like, What's that like for you in your mind, thinking about where you were and where you are now? Personally, it's yeah. it really is shocking. You know, when you think back and you look, look back on the journey and you're like, how did this happen? Uh, you know, never in a million years. I mean, nobody, nobody expected it. Not, not us and our family and not any, any of us who started. You know, when we started, what was 20 years ago? In UCLA, it was the beginning of this whole kind of expansion. That was the beginning of when, like, um, the Wilson and Horn family started to fund couples going out to campus. Um, there were there were ten positions opened uh, in the initial bump in in South uh, Southern California, and they never found ten. And they hired nine couples. They couldn't find them. what they just weren't there weren't that many people interested or willing to go out. Why? Wow. Um, so I was really young, and you know, I was twenty three. I was in Kolel and I was learning about Berbowitz and uh, the organization came out. They were interviewing everybody. They were trying to find people that were being on everybody's door. Like, if you have a pulse, they're like, I don't care if you're Jewish. Just like, we need rabbis. Come on. <laughs> and they were really trying to find people. They spent the full year. And they came they said, yeah, we wanted to uh, meet with you. And I'm like, oh, like, I'm here. I'm good. I'm down. It's fine. You know, whatever. They said, no, listen, we have a lot of positions open. We'll, we'll talk in, you know, maybe in three years, it'll end up being good. But let's just start a conversation. We spoke and they're like, listen, we need you to come, you know, <laughs> let's go, whatever. So I, I said, listen, I'm really not, I'm not interested. This is you wrote Roberto Bootsy Rebbe. I said, yeah. They said, okay, so why don't you ask him? I said, okay, fine. I'll, I'll ask it. Like, you know, whatever. Trap. Trump card. It was a trap. It was oh, a trap. Yeah. <laughs> it was a trap. I went to Roberto <laughs> and I said, you know, yeah, crazy conversation they had. Uh, uh, they want me to go. So, well, do they have other people? I said, ah, well, probably, you know, fine. He said, I understand. How many positions they have? They have 10. How many have they hired? I'm like, not 10. He goes, then you have to go. You have, have to go. He said, you have to go. Yeah. And Th it's literally been Malcolm Shea and Ish. There's and nobody what, else. And, and then you're like, okay, I have to go. Or was it like, oh. And where was your wife in on all this? Like, you at, the, at that point, where were you Where were you residing? We were living in Ramat Pichemesh. We were living in Ramat Pichemesh. And you're not like told to move to like New York or UCLA. UCLA. Cali. Yeah. The belly yeah. of the beast. 
Yeah. So Bam went over here for We LA. didn't know. We didn't know. And remember, there were no positions, right? So this is completely new territory. It's like, go and be uh, blah, blah. Like, <laughs> what is that? What do I do? What did my job look like? How does it work? And nobody can answer the question because nobody's ever done this really. Right. So we went out to LA on like a pilot trip and we sat and we met with a whole bunch of students. We we're like, we're chilling, you know, we're having a good time. We're schmoozing, we're talking, whatever. And they're like, okay, great. Like, looks like you could do this. I'm like, what? That's it? They're like, yeah. No, they're like, oh, no, no, no. Also, you do have to go to Israel on trips. Like, that sounds okay. like a perk. No? You, want me to, you want me to chill on campus, schmoozing with Jewish students, and then go to Israel? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, you got to touch my wife. I'm like, you want to do it? She's like, yeah, let's do it. So they're like, like, we're going to pay you in strident layers. You yeah, know? well, <laughs> you know, in the early days, it started off a lot uh simpler but it, it but it was it was fair like it was, yeah. it was it was they were offering a real salary it was the beginning um and we're like okay so let's let's try this thing we started in ucla um and then that grew um they were looking for somebody to kind of like manage all the, the educators over there so i started working with the educators across south south uh, southern california um and then other branches started oh there programs started opening all across the country what were you seeing in in the in, in the kids and the students that you were coming into contact with I, I assume these are college students yeah in UCLA so what um this is several years ago the challenges today are not the challenges then the challenges then are not the challenges today unless you're gonna tell me wrong and care it's always been the same but what were you seeing uh you and your colleagues what were you seeing like what was what, what battle were you up against at that time we definitely have to talk about the challenges today versus uh or what we're seeing today Let's call it versus what we were saying then, because there's there's some myths we have to dispel. Sure, sure, why not? Um, but but then you know when we went out to campus, we we kind of went out with with training. You know, there was this uh, program near LF, which was actually an OLME program, the, the earliest OLME program. Um, and and we did a lot of training about like uh, reform, conservative, orthodox. Like, what do people believe and and all this stuff? And we got to campus and we didn't find any of that. Like, it was just people who just didn't know. Hey, you know, I sat down with one one kid, and uh, he starts telling me, like, quoting chapter and verse from like, the Torah in English. And I was like, "Wow! Like, how do you know all this?" He goes, "Oh, Christian Sunday school." I'm like, great. Oh, and wonderful! Like the one kid who actually knew something about the Torah. Um, but the kids were were really far, like much farther than we had anticipated. You know, far like they were closer to Christianity than they were to Judaism or? Yes, in the sense, like if you would ask them, like who's Moshe's mother and who's Jesus's mother, like you're going to, you're going to, they're going to know much more about Christianity than they are about, you know, Torah and Moshe. Um, just, just ignorance. ignorance. Yeah, yeah, total ignorance. You know, we had a student that we invited for, you know, a Shabbat meal. Come, you know, why do you come for the Shabbat meal? They're like, great. What night of the week is that? Nice. You know, wow. it's like, oh my gosh. Crazy. Hey, we had a kid who came, uh, apply to an Israel trip. Um, and you know, you try and find out like, all right, what's your background? Like, you know, when I, so he said, listen, Rabbi, I'm really sorry, but I, I, I totally secular back. Like, okay, bar mitzvah. No, no bar mitzvah. You got to do Passover. I'm sorry, but like, I just can't fast for eight days. Yeah. We're like, wow. Like yeah. you're really far. Like, if that's like, what Passover is. that is not what's going on. Yeah. So it was, it was, it was a lot. It was a lot to kind of, you know, be understanding what's really happening on, on campus. Like the kids who just had no orientation. The well, imagine encountering that ignorance, tragic ignorance, drives the passion because now there's this need. There's neshamas within Klal Yisrael that are just so far removed. Yeah, and, and they're not against anything. It's also, yeah, it's very like, it's like, it's like if you're hungry and you got a plate, a plate full of food in front of you, it's like, easy goal, eat that. You have, you have guys, like, it's not like complicated, like, oh, no, like, they don't know Olive. Yeah. They need to be taught Olive. It's funny you say Hanmi, because we always talk about Mike Horowitz. Mike Horowitz came to us, you know, for Shabbos meal when we, early on when we got to UCLA. And uh, after the meal, he was like thanking us, but like, he was thanking us in a way that was like a bit much. You know, you're just going on and on. And I'm like, listen, the food was great. It was really amazing. It was a nice chill. I put in big time, but I'm like, it's it's cool. Like, it's fine. You could you're welcome to come back next week. Like, you know, it'll be fine. Because you understand, I haven't had a home cooked meal in five years. I feel like this is just different. And we're like, wow, like it's a whole culture. Like it, there's so much that they you know, when somebody's exposed to Judaism, basic Jewish family and Jewish values to like it's unbelievable. It's, it's really amazing yeah. to see that. You know, so they are hungry a little bit like literally. literally. <laughs> 
I, I want to pause you in your story there for a second because it is very interesting. And to be honest, I always love when I'm doing a podcast where I don't know the answer. Like, like one of the things me and Momo do is not much before an episode. <laughs> we like we talk, and it's it's very calculated because like if I know your story, then it's just me sitting in autopilot here. Like, okay, we're gonna be landing soon. I have no idea what happened. <laughs> like, you could have told me you worked for McDonald's next year. I wouldn't even know. Um, no, I love you though. Um, <laughs> so back to my parentheses. This is a long one, right? Kirov, it's very interesting mm. because I, I feel like back then I totally hear it. Like people were unaffiliated completely. I find it interesting. I've been encountering this every every now and then, and I'm not. I, I am Chabad like background. But I'm not out there doing Mitzayim every day in Crown Heights, whatever. They probably see it a lot more. But for me, there was two situations. One was I was by my brother's house on Purim, and he has a he had a neighbor who came over for the suit. They they were nice, invited him. He came over. I don't think he was running Yamaka. Him and his wife, and all of a sudden, like my like uh, Chabad senses like started tingling. Spidey's. Yeah. <laughs> so I shot a web at his face, and he started choking. <laughs> no, I I. I ran, like I ran to my. I'm like, hey, sir, do you, you want to film today? He's like, what? Like flactories? <laughs> He's like, no, I actually am 74 and I haven't put on since I was 13. I'm like, okay, one second, I'll be right back. I had my tefillin in my car. I ran to my car, got it, put on tefillin. It was the first time I put on tefillin since the bar mitzvah. Wow. And I, and to me, I'm like, very nice, beautiful, amazing, right? But another part of me is like. This is two. This is 2023. We spend hundreds of millions of dollars in 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 Kirov every year. How is there a yid living in Cedarhurst that has not put on tefillin since he was 13, or how has not completely not been touched? And like, I asked him. He said yes. Mm. Do you, do you like? This might be like a bone to pick. This might mm. be like a, mm. I'm challenging you on mm. this, but we are like all in on this Kirov movement, and it's incredible how many people are falling through the cracks and how, how many people are we not reaching and what can we do to reach them better? Yeah. He asks in a parenthesis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, I, by the way, I was never good at, at grammar in school. What's a parenthesis is the squiggly line, right? I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, first of all, it's, it's gotten in a way harder. Um, definitely. It's, it's harder naturally because 20 years ago, uh, most kids, who were Jewish came from a home that had two Jewish parents. Also, like Holocaust survivor type, like perhaps there was that conversation. They went to right. a Jewish summer camp. There, there was something, you know. If you started benching around the table, there were a group of kids who were going to bench along because they had some familiarity. Even if it was mall, they got them somewhere. Today, you're a generation late, literally twenty years later. So you're seeing like kids of that generation, and they're much more secular, and they have a lot less of an affiliation. So thereby. It's, it's harder to connect, you know, when you're talking about basic uh, opportunities. So there's, there's that, that distance and thereby the intermarriage and assimilation is much worse, right? Today, they, what they're saying, and it, look, if you, if you meet people on the street, you go to UCLA, you go to any campus, this is what it looks like, right? It's 80% of kids today, the young generation are marrying out. That, that is um, tragic. tragic. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it is a tragic statistic, but when you make it real, it's like, this is the lie. You know what I mean? This next 20 years, this is where, when we were on campus, they were saying there's 50, 60%. Now we're 20 years later, those 50%, you know, married out, the kids of those 90 plus percent marry out, right? The wow. kids of intermarried families almost all marry out. It makes sense. It's not a critical thing. They're not particularly connected. Right? They're going to they're gonna generally marry out. And again, while intermarriage is a stat, the, the critical thing that's really happening is actually assimilation, which means that the student's not even going to say, like you ask them, like, so what are you? They won't even say they're Jewish. And not on principle, it's just like they don't, don't identify. It. Yeah, they don't. No, oh, my my dad's Christian, my mom's Jewish. Like, I don't, we don't really do any of that stuff. Like, I'm just American. So, so that's that's on the challenge side. The upside, and and this is really, I think, what's what's the story that is so important um, is that people are getting connected. Many more people than most people know. Okay, like in thousands, like crazy numbers. When I went back to Bergwitz and I sat with him and I was talking to him about going to work for all of me and I was like, I didn't realize how big this thing is. Like, there are thousands of people who are, who are starting to keep Shabbos every year who are going to Yeshiva. Like, things are happening. And they said, what? How many people? Like, 2,500 people a year. It's like, what? What are you talking about? The 2,500 people a year. That's a lot of people. Yeah. 
25, like 25,000 kids a year get connected from several their backgrounds and are marrying Jewish now where they weren't before. So then that, so that, that's the case and that 80% number should start going downwards. Uh, so the reality is that even though we're, you know, right now we're seeing in the pure world so many people connecting, it's still a small percentage of the population, right? If you have over a million people who are between 20 and 30 years old, and you're connecting with twenty five thousand. You're still reaching such a small percentage. So how? So how? Like, so what's the answer? Like, I'm, I, I personally feel like I, uh, I was watching a Super Bowl like with you know, tens of millions of others. You didn't watch it, classic moment, right? You know. I was at the uh, missionary China seeing my shots with my son. If you said you were at the Super Bowl, that would have been a moment. Yeah, no, I was with my son. <laughs> we learned Mishnayos. They did a beautiful program uh, near Muncie. Yes, yeah, so I can't follow that up with much. I, <laughs> but I, I love God. That's, that's all I'll say. But, you know, Robert, Check it out next year, Nachi. It's yeah. fire. Well, it's on the same night as the Super Bowl, you say? Um, <laughs> you remind me, it's the guy who asked his, his rabbi, right, that Cole Nidre conflicted with the Game 7 of the World Series in October. So he has a major conflict. And the rabbi's like, well, you don't have a DVR? He goes, oh, it's brilliant. What channel is Cole Nidre on? <laughs> Very good. Well, unfortunately, it's on Zoom in a lot of places nowadays. Yeah. <laughs> but we'll get to that. Um, okay, hold up one second. We'll get right back to this episode of the Meaningful People podcast. But first, I want to tell you about this amazing raffle that is benefiting the Chicago Chesed Fund. First of all, what is the Chicago Chesed Fund? It's an organization that is dedicated to helping families in crisis and is funding 80 plus programs and services right now. The goal is really helping families get back on their feet by, by navigating government government funding and much more, offering goods and services like food, furniture, job placement. So you right now can win a Tesla by helping out the Chicago Chesed Fund. They're having a raffle. You go to Tesla X, Model X, S, Y, or 3, or even a Cybertruck. Or you know what? Just take the $50,000 cash. You can do that too. And that is right now, if you enter this raffle, you can get $25 off by using promo code MPP, that is MPP, head to ccfraffle.com, that is ccfraffle.com, use promo code MPP to get $25 off your order. This is an amazing raffle, but more importantly, they are benefiting an amazing organization. If you buy two or more tickets before July 11th, you'll be automatically entered into a prize drawing for a chance to win a special prize that has a value of over $1,600. So go find out what that is. Head to ccfraffle.com, use promo code MPP, and you'll thank me later when you're $50,000 richer and also richer upstairs in your spiritual bank account because you support an amazing organization. Now, back to the episode. Uh, Robert Kraft did a whole campaign for the anti-Semitism stuff, right? And Yeah, and um, you know one of the ads I think was amazing. Father sitting in the car with his son, you know, the kid had written a anti-Semitic slur on, on a Facebook page and they're outside of shul in the car and his father is pointing to them. And he says, these are the people you're writing that about. Mm. Like, these are the people you want to go say to their face. And um, it was impactful, but more than being impactful to just me, it was impactful to an audience of people watching the Super Bowl. Mm. Like I am a big believer in like, we need to, we need to have ads mm. during, during the NBA finals, during like, there's a Jew who's a huge sports fan who's Jewish and maybe a 30 second ad spot. Maybe that'll pull him a little bit closer to one of the Olami branches. Agree or disagree? Yeah, wholeheartedly agree. Uh, that's definitely where it's going. Right? It's definitely going now. We're, we're, you remember it. Now, so long ago, there were no jobs, right? So now there are jobs. There's a whole infrastructure community. There's people getting involved that are regular races. Thousands of people going to trips. Thousands of people going from like, that's awesome. Now we're saying, all right. How do we know it's in the Jewish people? That's really the conversation on the table. Yeah. Right? Because we have now 20 years to basically look at a generation of what's going to happen. And it's not us, right? Now Now there's actually a group of people you can turn to and say, okay, what are you guys doing about it? So now you can turn to us and say, hey, what are you guys doing about it? So yes, media is definitely kind of the next frontier of what has to happen to reach in the masses. The critical part of that is that you need infrastructure so that it goes somewhere. Somebody sees an ad, they see right. a video, and then they're like, oh, it's amazing. You know, what do I What's do? the call like, to action? You know, like, I don't know, you know. So then, then like everything else, then it's pretty it's fleeting, cool. yeah. It's super fast, super fast. So, um, you know, now now that there is an infrastructure, um, now now there's a, is the critical tide and the responsibility that we have to expend. So media is a huge part of the plan moving forward. Yeah. I'm going to close that parentheses, but I'm definitely going to reopen it. So you're, you're climbing the ranks. Uh, you're in UCLA. You're killing it. You're making people religious or bringing them closer. You're totally not. You're shaking your head. <laughs> we don't make people religious, but yeah. People became religious due to the efforts that you put in. 
yeah, you know, people people became religious because people became religious, right? Because people made choices. Why is everyone well. in Kira so humble? <laughs> no, no, I think it's 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 important, like from an ideological perspective. Yeah. you know, let's hear we, it. We have to be careful, like what we do and what we don't do. You were not yeah. evangelicals, like we're not. I don't know what evangelicals do because I don't know if they're magicians, right? But at the end of the day, the only thing that you can do is some form of education. Yeah, we do experiential informal education. We invite them for Shabbos. We talk. We teach classes. We go on trips. We do all those things. At the end of the day, like the beginning of the day and the end of the day, it's their, like it's up to them, right? Some people are open and interested and they're curious. Some people are really not. Yeah. It's there's close of Who knows? You know, I think that reframe is super, super important to highlight because if someone is trying to make someone religious, like that's, that's fail. That's doomed to fail from the start. Yeah. Right. And like yeah. you said, any, anyone that has introduced any change into their own life, like they have to understand that their own enlightened self-interest has to tell them that yeah like they have to make that choice and they can become educated and they can be enlightened and they can have experiential i like the way you phrase that experiential learning by going to a shabbos table like that's incredible and then people can make some choices and don't get me wrong right when when a student comes back after whatever amount of time to you know in that moment that schmooze that the discussion yeah. we had you know over whatever it was you know that coffee that moment of masada you know, then turned around my whole life. You're like, yeah, all right, no, I feel great um, because because it's a, it's a, it's a close, it's an amazing opportunity. It's such a great thing. What what do I want to spend my day doing? Right, right. I spend my day going and doing wonderful things, making money, doing whatever, or I can go and share the beauty of Judaism with somebody who didn't have access to it. And if they took that and made the choice to go and build a Jewish life and connect to Hashem and connect the to Torah, um, what a, what an awesome thing that I had it's supposed to be a part of. Is there an element of it like? They asked. Uh, they asked Kobe Bryant once. He won. He won game two. They were up two nothing in a series. They said, "Why, you, Kobe? Why are you not smiling?" He said, "Job's not done. Two zero. Job's not done." Um, is there an element to this uh, for you and your and anyone, anyone who's involved? Really, you could just speak for yourself. Like, very good. You know, we believe as Jews that you save one, you save a world. And Jonathan is now keeping Shabbos, and he's good. We have a lot of work to do. We have so many people that we need. Is there like that job's not done? So I'll, I'll tell you the arc, how I see it, okay? It, it starts with that you got you to gotta be positive. You got to live the simple. You got to you know, appreciate every day. It's amazing. And you got to really cry. You got to really cry because it's, it's, really, it's really rough what's going on. And then I had the biggest the hum of the whole story, and then I can get back to being the simple all the time. I had a great, a great split at the, the beginning when I started working all of me, to me with Ramosh Shapiro as oh, wow. And he was, he was the, the Rebbe to a lot of people in all of me, a lot of the you know, senior educators that we all know and love and appreciate. Um, and I, I, I had gone to issue him, you know, when I was younger, but I never sat, sat down with him, you know, like talk. And uh, I got to meet with him, we had a very long meeting and um, we had to talk about a lot of things that I was thinking about what we were, what we were going to build this building, this, what you know, all on me. And I asked him, I said, listen, you know, I had, um, I'd worked in different Kirov organizations over the previous years. And there were different thoughts that people had, different opinions about how we're supposed to look at it. And when you speak to people in, in the world today, in the Jewish world, in the firm world, for sure, you ask them like, oh, what's, what's the attitude we're supposed to take about assimilation? Do we say that, look, you know, uh, we have to do our efforts, but at the end of the day, 80% are going to intermarry. Yeah. And it's very reminiscent of the story of Mitzrayim. And people love quoting that. And they yeah. say, Chamushim, they left, one-fifth, 20% only left, so 80% say, but see, it's the same number. So it's happening. It's exactly history happens itself. This is really what's, it's even meant to be. It's part of the And we can rationalize inactivity because of that. Maybe that way, or maybe just feel okay with myself that, you know, it's going to be okay. Or are we supposed to have the kind of, you know, I worked for, for Aish for many years. I had the, this close to be close to, and I, I got to speak, spend a, a good amount of time at the end of his life with Rav So he was like, no, you got to go save Jewish people. So I asked Rav Noah Shapiro, what, what, what's the right Ashkafa? How am I supposed to look at it? So he looked at me and he said, you know, I don't know, can't say that. It's like, whoa, okay, I'm sorry. So like, that's not right. Can't say it without lose, you know, majority of the Jewish people. Can't say that. And he thought about it for like a few long moments. He goes, all right, I'll tell you what you should tell them. Now I'm like, all right. I'm, like, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm paying attention. And he, this is such a crazy moment. 
he reaches out his hand like like he reaches out his hand and he's looking at me with his hand stretched out with a hand just like we know that iconic scary evil looking kind of hand stretching out and he's just looking at me with his hand stretched out and i'm thinking there ain't no way i'm saying that i'm just not i can't like come on you gotta explain this to me because i don't know what's going on over here and he's not saying anything and i'm thinking he's just gonna finish and be like yeah just go go say that you know and i'm like i don't know what i'm supposed to do over here and after this very very long pause he looks at me and he goes basia and i'm like oh yeah that's exactly what i thought you were saying like no and then he's like why did she stretch out her hand? And I'm thinking, I don't know. I don't care. Just as long as it's not the other outstretched hand, that's fine. You know, whatever. So he goes, why did she stretch out her hand? And I'm like, I don't know. She wanted to reach. He said, but she couldn't reach. It was ridiculous. She obviously couldn't reach. So why did she stretch out her hand? He said, because when you see a baby crying, you have to stretch out her hand. The human thing to do is to stretch out your hand. He says, this is what you have to tell them. This is important. So here's an opportunity because we're all together and now I can tell them, okay? Mm. I don't know if this mic works. <laughs> he said, tell them they're all coming back. They're all coming back. Gvalt. I said, they're all coming back? He said, they're all coming back. I said, okay, great. <laughs> as long as you say so, I'm going to go tell them they're all coming back. So by the way, guys, they're all coming back. And with that, like the simcha comes back. Yes, it's sad, it's scary, but don't worry about it. It's good. Just we got to do our thing, stay up all night. I was up really, really late last night preparing for the morning's meeting. I was up really early this morning <laughs> going to the meeting, and we're running, we're going, whatever, because we know they're all coming back, and it's now. That's awesome. Because it's going to happen now, right? Either they're all going to leave or they're going to come back, and he said they're coming back. So if they're all coming back, that means in the next few years it's happening. Wow. It's happening, baby. Like, hold on. Wow. But, you know, like teams walk into a locker room and they have like a saying, <laughs> like Ola Mi's like front door, they'll come back. They're all coming back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Walks in, woo! Big time. The Basia piece, that I think is Rabhaim Shmulevitz's Vart in, in Sichus Musar about you have to outstretch the arm and then the Abisher does the rest. But that that addition for Moshe Shapiro, that they're all coming back, that's an inevitable outcome. The light of Mashiach brings everyone back. Did the, source. did the Rav say it like they're all coming back, like they're all going to come back? Or did he say it like, no, 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 they're all coming back. Like you need to go bring them back. He said you should go and tell everyone. In other words, the kind of effort you should put in is an effort with the confidence and the clarity. They're all coming back. Don't, don't be, don't, don't be like, you know, don't be busy with don't the be statistics. sad and, and don't give up, you know, and don't stop. You got to put in the maximum effort. You know, Rav Noach had a beautiful fight about this. Rav Noach used to say that the, the Mishnah says, Lo alecha amlacha meruva, uh, Lo alecha amlacha ligmar, Lo viata ben chorin li bato mimena, right? So he said, the way that most people use that is to get off the hook. He says, oh, it's not on me to finish the job. So like, okay, I'll just, I'll, uh, you know, I'll dial it in. He goes, no, 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 no. It's not on you to finish the job. Who is it on you to finish the job? Kodesh Baruch is going to finish the job. He says, one second, if the Almighty is going to finish the job, what kind of effort do you have to put in? You have to put in an effort where the job is going to get done. He goes, you got to go in 100%. It's going to get done. So I'm working on the Almighty's team. Yeah. You don't want to make any like errors when, you're, when you got God as the closer. You got to deliver something nice. Put in 100%. That's it. 100%. Nothing less. Because they're all coming back. Gewalt. They're all coming back. I like that a lot. I like that a lot. And I, and I imagine it's something that you clearly have ingrained. Um, you, you went from UCLA being the 10th couple to now ninth, being ninth, ninth, got it the ninth man. Oh, you're the ninth man. So the song is about you. AB, <laughs> AB was thinking about you. Interesting. Okay. Finally met you. Can yeah. I open a parenthesis before getting back to uh, UCLA? When I close mine. Go. Um, <laughs> Rene Weinberg. Mm. You, you shared that you had an opportunity to, to spend time when you were at Aish. I would love to hear about your interactions with him. What an unbelievable visionary. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was amazing. You know, when I started in UCLA, I was working there for a few years, and then I was just so frustrated with what was happening in the broader picture that I, I went to go meet Rav Noach. I had never met him before. Um, and I, I went into his office. He was in New York, and I went to meet him, and I said, listen, Shiva, I, I heard that you're concerned about the Jewish people. I just want to be on the team. I don't care. I'll sweep the floors. It doesn't matter. Just, just give me, you know, 
He says, all right, so what are you going to do? You know, he wasn't going to like let me off the hook like that. He's not going <laughs> to let me just go sweep the floors. Yeah. So I told him, you know, I had some ideas, whatever. He goes, okay, great. You're hired. I was like, no, 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 I have a job. Like, I can't, I can't just, you know, it's like, it was wild. And I got to the office and there were three other guys who were hired to do the same job as me. I was like, wait a second, what are you guys? It was like, what? Oh. So, which is classic, right? Because he was totally committed to the mission. Totally committed to the mission. And uh, once I was working at age, so there was a period of time where he was in New York for like a month. It was around the dinner and there was, there was a conference that was happening. And I got into the office whatever time in the morning. And whatever time I got in, he had been there already. And it was clearly he was getting there earlier. So I kept getting in earlier, figuring like, if I can get there early enough, then I'll get a few minutes with him, like, you know, to grab him for you know, a few minutes. So I, I was getting there like, you know, 7, 6.45, 6.30. Finally, I like beat him. I don't remember. It must have been 6 o'clock in the morning. So he shows up into the office. And I'm like, great. Uh, can I get the Shiva coffee? He says, yeah. So I said, how's Rashiva want it? He asked me, he said, put in an eighth of a packet of Splenda. Like it stuck with me. I'm like, do you know how little is an eighth of a packet of Splenda? So I went and in. How difficult it is to measure? I, I'm seeing, you can imagine like, me in the kitchen. You take it and all I'm out there first, like, and then I, I would put the whole freaking packet. in. <laughs> you put it in eight. Did you say an eighth, eight, eight packs? <laughs> he, um, so then I brought in the coffee. So now I had an excuse to speak to him, and I said, like, you know, he's very busy with like, um, you know, radical Islam and and what's coming and whatnot. And I was trying to understand it. I said, like, what does Rashiva want from it? And he looks at me and he goes. You know the story of Esther? Huh? Like, yeah, I think so. He goes, no, you don't know the story of Esther. And he like, you know, slaps me across the face, punched me in the <laughs> stomach, you know. He was like, very like, you know, come on, like, what's the story of Esther? Now, mind you, this, this ex action happened every day for like weeks. I went in every day. Do you know the story of Esther? No, slap across the face, punch in the stomach. Like, I got used to it. It was like a whole rhythm. We kept going over this thing. I just didn't, understand. I was like, what is, what do you want? And he kept telling me the story about how Esther's the one time in Jewish history where the Jewish people were really, it looked bad. I mean, that, that was it. It was like, it yeah. was going to be lost. He goes, and they came back. And they're like, Revach la you said la Yehudim. That's it. Everybody's good. And we just, we celebrated like, yeah, yeah, okay, good. He goes, no, no, that's, that's now. There's threat coming to the Jewish people. Jewish people look like it's going to be a bad story, but they're going to come back. Every day, he's like, do you know the story of Esther? You got to keep, get that story. It sticks with me, you know? Wow. I, I never, obviously never had this. I never had this class to meet everyone at Hoenberg, but like being in a room with someone who, of that stature, of, of the, like those accolades, but mainly that vision. And, and now you are, are the visionary. You, know, you are a visionary at Olami. You're the executive director. What impact, I guess, just even being in the room with Rav Noah Weinberg, flesh and blood. You know, for me, it's videos, pictures, you know, and there are not many of, of the videos, but like what impact did that have uh, on your life and decisions you make? It sticks with me a lot. You know, I, thank God I had the, the great chus and continue to have, with, have a, a very close cashier to Rav Berkowitz. And uh, he, he sticks in my mind a lot, uh, you know, pushes us to be bigger and, and to think broader. And Rav Noach, Noach always challenged the status quo. You know, he was always a step, I would say a step ahead. He was, he was like many, many steps ahead. You know, the, the classic line in H was when you would have a conference and there would be a hundred rabbis in the room and he would, you know, they would ask for a brainstorm session, give us, you know, ideas. So they would go around the room and everybody would collect the ideas. They put it up on all the boards and then they would turn to their shiva. And he goes, uh-huh. Okay, so I had all of those, and here are the 20 others, you know? <laughs> and he really did. He really had, like, in addition to everything that everybody came up with, he had 20 more. It was like, it's just, he was pushing beyond, and he was always like, he would always, you would sit in a room, and it was always about, like, God, do it, you know? Yeah. Like, get it done. Do you care enough? Is it deep enough? And it was always from this deep place of Torah. It was such a connection. It was so real with Hashem different you know it's like it's hard to always stay focused in that way to be deeply connected you, know, you can get into programs you can run organizations you can do things but to be so deeply connected on an ishama level you know it's we miss them yeah take us one step on on that thread how does one take that next jump mm. from the inspiration which by its very nature is fleeting but to ignite that nishama in a sustainable way First thing is definitely a relationship. 
uh, all, all, everything that's happening is starting by relationships. And that's that's the center of what's happened over the last 20 years in this Kiruv movement and Olami that now it's known as. But um, the, the key is the relationship because from from a person who's not connected perspective, so like that's, they'll have a, an inspirational moment, but then then what, right? So it's it's really on the other person's side, let's say on the, on the rabbi's side who's going to say, hey, it was great having you for Shabbos last week. Why don't you come again next week? Or let's get coffee or somebody to keep it going so that that inspiration doesn't disappear. So the, re- the relationship is key. And then the second thing is, is uh, learning, um, getting exposed to Torah in some way. Generally, like I said, you know, we tend to lean on a lot of informal experiential learning. Um, so Shabbos meal is a learning, right? That's a, that's a learning experience. But there, there's a lot of classes and, and discussions that are happening. Um, but ultimately, ultimately, the biggest transformation happens on immersive experiences. It's generally trips. You know, you need time out of the general environment. And we all do. Right. We yeah. know what it is. Even Yantif tends to be that for us. Right. The whole Zman of El leaning into Tishrei it tends to be an immersive experience that, that transforms us. Um, we're gifted that in our normal schedule of being Jews. Like that's what it means to be a from Jews. You have Pesach and some time in the year that you're going to get back in the zone when you're in the sukkah. It's, a, it's an immersive experience. And you're definitely not fasting. <laughs> that's no, for sure not. not eight days no sir so so that that's really where you see the transformation happen where people are like wow i totally did not see life that way um, and then that tends to be much stickier we'll be right back to this episode of the meaningful people podcast you might be noticing i'm wearing this tailor-made sweatshirt this is a beautiful sweatshirt that is a meaningful people podcast swag from the support grudco episode you can hit the link below and and the go ahead and order one. There are only a few left available, and I don't think we're going to be reordering anytime soon. So make sure you get your hands on one. But you know what? Re- re- recently this week, I was by Kosher Palooza, and I had a really good time. So many of you came up to me. Really was amazing. But I made a huge mistake. And the mistake I made was I wasn't wearing collars and co. I was wearing some polo shirt with a floppy collar. And every picture I'm seeing from that event is, is just making me cringe. Like, what was I thinking? So don't be like me. Or don't be my, don't be like me at Kosher Palooza. Be like the smart version of Nachi who wears collars and co. Who head to collarsandco.com and orders a beautiful shirt that comes with a strong collar and a soft shirt, and you will look amazing. Yeah, I know you're gonna find those pictures and say, yeah, Nachi, I don't know what you're thinking wearing a floppy collar like that. But maybe I wore it just so I can make this ad more relatable to you. That didn't look good, but make sure you look great. Head to collarsandco.com and use promo code Meaningful for fifteen percent off your order. Now back to this episode. So tell me, uh, how did you go from being doing Kirov on campus in UCLA to, you know, leading up an organization of this of the size, this magnitude, this mission? I transitioned from UCLA. I went uh, to Asia. I was working in Asia, New York. Um, really, most of the time was working on campuses across the New York area. Um, I've been managing a bunch of campuses you know there were about eight campuses in the general new york area um and then just about eight years ago um the Ray butler who's the president of olami and uh aaron wilson is you know one of those two major donors they came to me and they said listen everything that's happening in the world is really amazing stuff but we want to we want to turn olami we want to build a movement so i said um like, really <laughs> like you really want to do this? Um, and I, I honestly, I didn't believe them. I mean, so much so I didn't believe them. I actually thought I was kind of getting punked. Mm. Like I thought there was a camera. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I got, I, I, Promise real. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I just couldn't believe it. I was like, come on. Like, you guys are amazing. You've done so much good. And it's really wonderful what happens. But like, that's, you know, it's more a standard. Like, you know, yeah, you run trips, you have classes, whatever. You really want to build something much bigger. And they're like, yeah, we got to do it. We don't have time and we got to do more. I said to him, okay, like, what can we do? Like, got to try. And I turned to my Rebbe, I turned to her Berkowitz. I said, listen, I'm, I'm very happy. I, was, I, I love Eishat Torah. I mean, the, the, that's where I went because I wanted, to, I wanted to be dealing with the Jewish people. And that Rav Noach was, was the head of that. And even after he passed away, it's still what they're doing. And that, that was the core. I said, how do I leave this? He said, you, you can't, can't turn this around. You, know, you can't turn this away. If they're saying, let's go save the Jewish people, and there are resources behind it, so then, like, you know, all in. That's it. That's 
So we're trying, you know, we're trying every day. And, and, and this is the myth that we need to dispel. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. This has been in the news a number of times and like, say it here and say it loud. With a the, big erroneous. The next person who says that Kiruv is dead. Okay. I don't want to say they may get shot. That's too much. Okay. <laughs> but I mean, it is so absurd. It's so absurd. Yeah. There's more happening today than ever before in history. More. I haven't heard people say Kirov is dead. Like, oh my gosh, media outlets or people? It's been published in articles and different people, and, and we're like, are you kidding? Especially today, especially today. So why does a myth like that? Like, how does something like that come to people? Turn around. They said, oh, the yeshivas are empty. First of all, the yeshivas are full. Yeah, go there today. You can't get a bed. It's unbelievable what's happening. There are more people. We we totally overextended on trips last year. There were many more kids who wanted to go. There were sixty thousand kids that came involved in programs last year. Right, wow. the biggest we had hit before COVID was fifty thousand. Wow, so it's growing. It's growing in leaps and bounds. It's so much. There's so much more happening. There are more educators. We just had a conference last week with educators, and we gave awards to people who have been in the field for a decade or more. Yeah, there were more than 20 people that got the award, adding to 60 people who already got it beforehand. It's, it's growing. It's a new thing. It's new. So people were like, after two years that we were on campus, people were like, oh, where's all the, where's everybody be coming from? It's like, yo, chill, okay? They're human beings. It takes time and everybody grows in their way. But today, today is nothing to talk about. It's unbelievable. You go anywhere in the world. I was in France a few weeks ago. It, we, we just ran a conference in Spain. Right? We had a thousand people we brought to Spain for a week. And people came from all over the world. It's, it's unbelievable to see what's happening. <laughs> so Kirov Kyr is very much alive and kicking. And, uh, and by the way, they're all coming back. They're all coming, they're all coming back. back. Yeah. I, I, just to so you guys are getting into it. I like it. Yeah, you know? I love that. <laughs> here on the, on the wall. Yeah, they're all coming back. That's going to be on some merch soon. Um, that's awesome. But like, I want to, I want to, I, I want to challenge you a little bit. Yeah, please. I want to reopen my parentheses in terms of um, those who fall through the cracks because it happens. And and I want to ask you, is there is there something that anyone who's listening can do? I, I, I don't know if you're on the camp of like Kirov is not a profession. It's like, you know, it's a passion. I, I don't know if, if if that's controversial, is it? Like the Kirov, who said this once that like the Kirov the training stuff, like Kirov is just like, relationships and talking to people and and just building that out um but what can the average person do with their neighbor i have a neighbor now she's 76 she grew up in brooklyn massachusetts what's up jane and she's <laughs> shout out right there. yeah she's she's reform conservative her kid had a bar mitzvah but like they're all coming back so what do you do with her yeah well first of all everybody it's a mitzvah is a mitzvah. is a mitzvah. is a mitzvah. It, it's a mitzvah. Okay, it's many mitzvahs. Okay, but it's it's at least a mitzvah. Okay, so it, it's not a profession. Do people make a profession out of chinuch? Yeah, that's also a mitzvah. Guess what? It's also a profession, <laughs> right? Do people spend time getting trained to be good educators, great educators? Do people spend time to be trained to be great social workers and learn how to have social skills so that they can be more effective in helping people? I hope so. Yeah. So, of course, somebody who's going need out there. It doesn't need to preclude somebody from doing something for their for the next person. Opposite. They're obligated to do that. That's what I want to hear. You're obligated to, again. People you, can't you feel don't need me to say it. It's mitzvah in the Torah, but you know, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Everybody's got to do that. With with the challenges is what to do, and it's very yeah, it's very daunting and it's uncomfortable. Yeah, you meet somebody and you're like, hey, um, you know, you want to learn? I mean, you know, maybe Jane wants to learn with you, and that would be that would be interesting. Uh, it might be a little difficult. Um, she might love chicken soup on a Friday night, though. You know, she, she actually might, came over last Shabbos with her dog. And she like looks at me. He's like, "So you're Orthodox, right?" I'm like, "Yeah." Aren't you supposed to be in synagogue all day? I'm like, "No, yeah. <laughs> that's no. I don't. I don't think so. That's not what we do today." He's like, "Do you have a TV?" I'm like, "Maybe." <laughs> you know, like, why? Like, what's up? Just for the Super Bowl. Yeah, just for the Super Bowl. <laughs> nice. This year, I'm, I guess I'm gonna throw it out because I'm going to Mishnayis. Uh, there we go. Uh, Very deep. Yeah, what's can go to the missionary shrine to see my shots without throwing it out too. Totally, <laughs> DVR. Um, yeah, <laughs> um, but like, I still like what? What's what's the answer? What's the answer for like what do you what do you do for for someone like that? And in, in my case, it might be a Jane, and in someone else's case, it's it's another person. And there's people all over the world. 
and like we need, I feel like in order to for like 80%, right? Like I know like let's not focus on statistics, not only about statistics, we're talking about people. But I think the only way to get that 80% lower and to really actualize that they're all coming back is that if every single member of Klai Yisrael who keeps Shabbos, who learns, who is involved in their Yiddishkeit, they need to pull their weight. They need to bring somebody with them. Yeah. It's the only way. No? It seems that way. It seems that that's, you know, some some version of, I don't know if every single person, certainly as the as the religious community grows and the uh, un, unaffiliated community is is uh, becoming more assimilated, um, the, the balance is moving, right? So it becomes easier to imagine, right? Not every person needs to do everything. Uh, and you have a lot of professionals and you have people who are volunteers and you have people in all kinds of different ways. Um, but first of all, it's just on a personal level. If, if Jane is there or whoever is the person, a colleague at work or something, there's always something to do. You know, I, I, once a person moves away from this idea, I have to make them religious, which is, which is weird. Yeah. It's, you know, it's just strange. So that's, that's often the biggest thing that prevents somebody from doing something that would be normal, healthy, and responsible, right? right? So if you, if you actually just care about another person, then you would invite them for a Shabbos, or you would tell them about a resource, or you would just say hello, right? We always say like, wish them a happy birthday. Let's start there. Okay. Do you know when their birthday is? Can you give them a card, you know, get them something? I don't know, do something normal. You find out that they're sick, get, bring them some chicken soup to them. That's like, that kind of stuff is huge. That's what Baron Cutler like, said. Forget says, the end game and just be, in, be normal. There is enough. no end game. Right. There's no such thing. By the way, the what end Byron game. What did Sorry. Baron Cutler said that you have to first love them. Yeah. Because it says, Oy vesabrios from a Torah. So he says, the only way that it works is you have to Oy love bris. them. Yeah. If you don't love them and you try and be Makar of them, that's not Kiruv. The, the closeness comes because you love them. So you're sharing things. And as you're sharing things with passion and love, they're open to it. That's on them. That's their thing. It's so funny. I, I, was, I was practicing law in New York City for a few years, right out of law school. And I was a junior associate in a big firm. And I was spending, you know, some nights under my desk. And it was like living the dream. <laughs> Earth, <laughs> big law. And there was a, another associate at the firm. Jewish guy, completely, completely unaffiliated. Zero. Mm. Mamish zero. Like fasting on Pesach, mamish. And he lived right across the street, uh, like on Wall Street, and like living the life. And I became friends with him. We were colleagues. We worked on some cases together. Literally, I'm not exaggerating. We never talked about Yiddishkeit once. Mm. We just became close colleagues. He was dating a non-Jewish woman, and one day it became clear to me that they that they broke up. And I asked him, like, what what happened? Like, it was going so well. What happened? And he said, he said, I don't know. He's like, over the last two years, which is how long we were t working together. He's like, I just knew, like, I can't marry someone who's not Jewish. Mm. And like, he's like, I don't know. Like, I just I it became clear to me of late, like it's just not something that I can't do. Hmm. And he ended up marrying a Jewish girl. Wow. They have some kids now. They moved to Florida. Like unbelievable. That's a real cure professional. Yeah. That's what we call a cure. It's professional, right? Professional is you care, you share, you talk. It, it's, it's natural. They, anybody else gets that you're a religious Jew, right? They understand that. They figured that story out. <laughs> I'm not going to hire that, hide that part. So sharing in your natural way of your passion is for sure. Like that's the most, the most, most impactful way. And today there are more and more opportunities for people in the community, lay people to get involved uh, yeah. between Project Inspire and Partners in Torah. And now we started a whole mentorship program. We have thousands of people that are getting involved and meeting with students on a regular basis as volunteers. Um, so it's, it's, it's growing and it's more and more and more. And that will happen, right? Ultimately that, that's going to be the, the Chuva movement, right? That's how they yeah. say it's going to happen. It seems like, you know, all all the greats, in, just in this podcast, you mentioned Rabbi Tzabarkovich, Rabbi Weinberg, Rabbi Aaron Cutler, Moshe Shapiro, and like all all these, all the greats, and the list goes on, you know, Lava Treba, about, about Shluchim, and, and you mentioned Rav Noach, like they, they've set the marching orders. They're all coming back. So, are you with us or are you against us? 
<laughs> you know, like uh, nobody's to, against us. Head to armyforces.com. <laughs> <laughs> no, no one's against us. So you just got to check the box. You're with us. And um, thank you for giving Nachi a title, by the way, for the episode. <laughs> he always, sometimes he like, he me like six me. hours. He's like, I don't have a title. I'm like, I'm so bad at this. And they're all coming back. That's it. Yeah. If you could speak into that camera, the last thing yeah. I'll ask you to do about the, the the Jew who's watching this, who's maybe not so affiliated. Like, what would you say? say? Right now he's watching. They love you. <laughs> no, that's that's like, you know, in a, in a real way. Yeah. We have to we have to get out of this world of the bifurcation, the splitting of different groups. That that's that's a thing of the past. Today we're Jewish people, and it's time that we all rally together and come together as Jewish people, arm in arm, sing together, laugh together, celebrate together. That's the best. And happy birthday! Yes. <laughs> there you happy go. Happy birthday, Good Rabbi well. David Marquez. Thank you so much for giving us your time. Thank really you, great guys. Thanks so much. Thank you. All righty. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Meaningful People podcast. Go ahead right now, leave a comment, subscribe to our channel, and like this video to be entered into a raffle to win one of our tailor made sweatshirts. And if you want to support an amazing organization like Meaningful Men and Meaningful People, go ahead and buy one. Head to meaningfulmen.org. You can buy this sweatshirt, this crew neck, right now. It is extremely popular. We only have a few left in stock. Go ahead and grab yours. We really appreciate you listening to this podcast. I like I, I met so many of you at Kosher Palooza last week, and I really appreciate all of you really, really so much for supporting me, supporting the podcast, myself and Momo, and making this possible. If we were just talking here, nobody was listening. It would be quite boring. So thank you for listening, and thank you for subscribing and leaving a review. And I do look at the reviews, so I can't wait to see your review this week. Thank you so much, everybody. Have an amazing week. We'll be back at you with another episode next week. Adios. Hope you enjoyed this video from Meaningful Minute. We have so much more content for you. You may like this. You may like this. Take your pick. Let us know what you think.